Hello everybody, welcome to ISSC 421 Network Computer Security. Uh, my name is Professor Labarge and we're going to be covering uh, lab number one, analyzing protocols with Wireshark. Wireshark is probably the most widely used packet capture and analysis software in the world. Uh, it's available free of charge and while it lacks some of the more sophisticated diagnostic tools of similar commercial products, the use of Wireshark really saves many organizations thousands of dollars and thousands of man hours. Uh, Wireshark allows uh, you to capture network uh, traffic uh, and, and the ability to save frame detail in multiple formats, uh, which really makes it usable by the more sophisticated, more expensive software tools out there. What we're going to do is we're going to click on Wireshark and get this actually started. Uh, right here, this main screen, uh, computer's a little slow uh, on the network, uh, this is called the splash screen. Uh, it's your main screen of Wireshark. What we're going to do is we're going to click on the interface uh, piece. This is actually one of the more uh, important pieces uh, out there. Um, in, in this area right here describes, it, it lists uh, the different interfaces that are uh, out there. Um, on this uh, virtual machine, you only have one. It's called Student. It gives you the description of Citrix because we're on a uh, Citrix uh, server uh, with the IP uh, address. If you were running Wireshark on your local computer, it'd be possible that it would uh, you'd actually see many interfaces. Uh, it's also possible that some of the interfaces you were expecting to see may or may not appear at the list at all. Uh, if you know that a logical or physical interface uh, exists but it isn't showing up on the list, uh, you're going to want to check your WinPCAP uh, download and probably just reinstall it. You may have to also uh, reinstall any network interface card drivers uh, that you may have. As I had mentioned, most computers come with two uh, network interface cards. You got your wireless, and, and most computers still come with uh, the hardwired if you wanted to actually plug in a uh, CAT5 cable. If you were running virtual machines, uh, you would see you know, a plethora of different uh, logical uh, interfaces. So let's just go ahead and click Start. This is actually capturing network traffic as we go. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, click just uh, to get some network traffic uh, going just so that we can actually see some stuff come up. Right here, this window right here, you'll see three panes, one, two, and three down here. This first top pane uh, contains all the packets that Wireshark is capturing. It's in time order and provides a summary of the contents of the packet in a format very close to English. You'll see here you got your time, you got your source IP address, your destination IP address, the protocol that's uh, being utilized, the length of the packet, and a little bit about what it is. Um, keep in mind that uh, the content will be different depending upon where uh, you capture packets in the network. Uh, also remember that the source and the destination is relative to where a packet is captured. This top area right here is typically referred to as frame summary. Uh, this frame down here is actually considered frame detail. It's used to display the packet structure and contents of uh, fields within the packet. Uh, the area of Wireshark, as I had mentioned, is uh, considered frame detail, and this down here is byte data. So going back up here, if I was to click on an actual frame, I could dig in down deeper into uh, different aspects of that frame. Some of it may or may not be relevant. It just all depends on what you're actually looking for. Um, as I had mentioned, down here is called byte data. Uh, the byte data, all the information in a packet is actually displayed in hexadecimal format down here. All right, This actually becomes really important. Uh, if you were sniffing traffic on a network um, and they were using uh, unsecured uh, protocols, let's say Telnet. Telnet sends passwords in the clear. That's why we don't like using it. Um, but if you were using Telnet and the, the traffic was being captured, uh, you would be able to use Wireshark and see the password in this area right here. Um, and, and, and that goes back to just how easy it is to, to sniff uh, passwords out there that are sent in the clear. We want to use uh, secured protocols uh, such as SSH, uh, SFTP versus FTP. So anyways, you have those uh, three uh, different areas of uh, Wireshark. What's really important uh, to understand uh, with Wireshark is how it handles time. Uh, very often, certain events are reported relative to clock time. It's also important to consider the fact that the clock time may or may not be the same as a system time or the device or the devices used to run Wireshark 
and capture the packets. The timestamp used by Wireshark is, is the current system time on the machine upon which Wireshark is running. Uh, so if, if you got uh, Wireshark installed on uh, your computer, it, it's looking at your uh, system clock time, all right? Uh, in this case, we're running it in the VM. It's looking at the VM clock time. Uh, attempting to uh, synchronize Wireshark captures made on two different machines require consideration of time differences, including time zone. Uh, the potential problems can be alleviated somewhat by using network uh, time protocol, uh, commonly referred to as NTP, on both machines, but there's still a, a plethora of uh, issues such as uh, which clocks were used for the synchronizations. And even if the same clock is used, uh, there is a propagation delay for the timing packets, which could also introduce discrepancies Though small, uh, matter a lot, especially when capturing packets from high-speed interfaces. In order to overcome the time zone mismatches, an ad, a common uh, best practice is to use the uh, coordinated universal time, also known as UTC, that time zone. Uh, you'll see in uh, network security, digital forensics, a lot of things use the UTC time. Uh, so it's something that you should be familiar with. Um, so... That gives you the little overview. That's part one of the lab. What we're going to do is we're going to move into part two. We can go ahead and exit and just not save it. Uh, we're going to click uh, stop and save without, and then we're going to move on to uh, part two uh, here in a minute.